All right, today we're gonna do respiratory assessment. So the very first step of respiratory assessment is just to do an overall general survey of the patient. You're looking at the patient's posture. When patients have severe respiratory distress, they have a tendency to tripod, so lean over and hold themselves up with their arms. Think about the last time you were running a race. After you were done with the race, what'd you wanna do? You wanted to put your hands on your, on your knees. That's a form of tripoding. Our bodies naturally wanna do that when we have respiratory distress. So we're looking for a lack of tripoding. I want to see that there's an easy in and out, so you, they're not laboring to breathe. It's not going, <gasps> so you're not seeing them physically breathe difficultly. Um, we also want to look at what's known as the AP to lat ratio, so her lateral ratio of her chest to the AP lateral AP ratio of the chest. So when a patient is barrel chested, that happens in uh, severe COPD. What you'll see is they're expanded this way. So they're one to one ratio. Ordinarily, it should be a two to one ratio. So you can also look for that. Also looking at the patient's skin. Um, if they're having hypoxemia, they may have some cyanosis. And then you also wanna look at the fingers to look to see if there's clubbing. Um, so you can have the patient do like this, go like that. And you look to see if there's any space, just one finger, yeah. yeah. And what you're doing is you're looking to see if there's any space in between their fingernails. And there should ordinarily be some space between the fingernails. Once we've done the general survey, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna move to the respiratory assessment. So for the purposes of this video, go ahead and swing your legs to the side. And that way we'll just be able to see what's going on. Now, because we're gonna start in the back, we might as well do a back assessment very quickly. So what we're gonna do is take your fingers and you're just going to place them on either side of the patient's spine, press inwards, and wiggle your fingers back and forth. Is there any tenderness there? Nope. Okay, so if there were tenderness, we would note that whether it was on the spine or next to the spine. Then the next step is we're going to take our thumbs and we're gonna press them into the sacroiliac joint. Is there any tenderness there? And then the last thing we're gonna do is we are going to take a fist and we're going to start up high around shoulder blade level inside the shoulder blade and work our way down. Is there any tenderness there? And what we're looking for there is to see if there's any tenderness right here, which is the costovertebral angle. Right underneath the costovertebral angle are your kidneys. So if the patient's having kidney problems, they may experience some pain there. When you do your spinal and paraspinal palpation, what you're basically doing is you're putting your fingers like this and then pushing in and pressing. And so that's what you're trying to do all the way down their spine. Then when you do the, sac the sacroiliac joint, the SI joint, so this bone is the sacrum, this is part of the pelvis, but this particular part is the iliac crest. So the sacral iliac joint is right there. So what you want to do is you want to find that little spot with your thumb just inside it, press right there. If the patient has sacroiliac inflammation, that is going to be tender when you do that. The last thing for the costovertebral angle, costo, costo means uh, rib and then vertebral. So what you're, you're looking for is this last rib and the joint, the angle that's made by the last rib and the spine. And so when you're hitting, you're hitting right about there. This is where other kidneys live, right under there and right under here. So you start up here because sometimes if you go straight for the rib, straight for the kidney on a patient who's got kidney complaints, they they're faking it maybe. So by doing it up here, they might forget, to, oh yeah, that's supposed to hurt there. So that's the reasoning why you start high and then move down low. So costo vertebral angle, you're specifically looking for tenderness in this area right here. So we've done the general back assessment. Next, we're going to move on and do respiratory assessment. Now, all of the books would have you do all of these other steps first. First you inspect, then you palpate, then you auscultate, percuss, then auscultate. We're gonna reverse that. We're gonna do the auscultation first. Auscultation is the most important of the respiratory assessments, so you might as well start with it. So we're gonna take our stethoscope, we're gonna use the diaphragm, and we're gonna start at the base. Now, level of the bra is about where you wanna start, and you don't wanna place the stethoscope on the bra, just a little bit above it, and ask the patient to take a deep breath. Um, if you can't hear it, you might need to specify, take a big breath through your mouth. Okay. 
All right, now what we've done is we've done low, low, and then medium, and high. Now at this, pay, at this point, some patients might start to feel a little bit short of breath, or a little bit um, dizzy, because they're having hyper, hyperventilation. So you might need to take a break, or you can keep going. So in this case, we're actually going to keep going, and we're going to move just above the trapezius scalenus muscle here. We're gonna go inside of that, what's called the fossa. Take a breath there, and one more. And then lift your arm, please. And we're gonna take a breath here, and the other side. Now, one of the common problems, go ahead and raise your arm again for a moment. One of the common problems, a lot of times, well, people will listen down here. Well, there's no lung there. So remember, about the level of the bras where we start listening, so you actually have to listen here or even up a little bit higher. So you need to be a little bit um, more invasive than you think. You, you should almost feel like they're, you're going to tickle them because you're so high up into their armpit. Because if you're lower, you're just not listening to lung tissue. So now we've listened to the entire back. We're going to give the patient a break in terms of breathing, and we're going to do some other assessment. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to check for excursion. So we're going to place our thumbs on the patient's back about two inches apart with our fingers out to the side, and then we're going to pull the skin inwards and ask the patient to take a deep breath. And we're going to look to see our, if our thumbs separate. What we want them to do is separate um, evenly. If it goes like this with one going up and the other one pretty much staying the same, that is going to be asymmetry. And it's a sign that one of your, your patient isn't being able to expand their chest properly and symmetrically. So again, you see a lot of people do all sorts of weird things. Take your thumbs like this, like you can do a butterfly, and just place them on the patient's, on the patient's back. Pull the skin together and take a deep breath, please. Now, some of the things that happen sometimes is patients or students will go too far down here, take a deep breath, nothing happens because this isn't the patient's chest. This is actually close to their hips, this is the abdomen. So up here is where you wanna be. Fingers should be pointing to her armpits if you're doing this about the right level. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do what's called fremitus. So we're going to feel for the patient's um, vibration as they say a word. So a uh, classic word is 99. Some of the newer research says that blue balloon might be a better word as far as getting the vibration. So you want to use the heel of your palm, which is this ulnar surface. Um, you can also use the palm itself, but the ulnar surface is actually better. So you can do it one at a time always going side to side or two at a time. Take, uh, say, blue balloon, please. Blue balloon. Again? Blue balloon. Again? Blue balloon. Again? Blue balloon. And raise your arms. And one more time. Blue balloon. Okay. So what you should feel is symmetry on both sides. Next thing we're going to do is percuss. So to percuss, you're going to place your, your finger, um, trying to get this first joint on flat onto the patient's back. And then we're gonna use the other hand to tap. Now, there's a couple reasons. Uh, there's a couple things that can happen that could cause you not to hear a good percussion. So the first one is if you're placing your finger in a way where where you're not really hitting the finger touching them. So what you'll see sometimes is you'll see a student do this and then they tap up here. Well, you're never going to hear anything there. So you want to make sure you get this portion of your finger flat against the patient, and then the next thing is use some wrist action. Now, I've seen people produce good sound with all sorts of techniques that I thought would never work and don't work for me. So you've got to practice this and eventually you'll get it. You should be able to get it within about two weeks if you're practicing it a little bit every day. Two minutes every day, you should have it down within about two weeks if you're not a natural. I was not a natural. 
Okay, when it comes to assessing the lungs in the back, one of the things we wanna make sure is that we are auscultating and doing our fremitus on the inside of the scapula. So sometimes patients have a tendency to place their stethoscope like this. You're not gonna hear what you need to hear because you're trying to listen through the scapula. So make sure you're on the inside. The same thing goes when you do your percussion, you want to have your finger placed on there. And then when you do your fremitus, you wanna make sure that your fremitus is inside the scapula. Um, one nice thing about a patient as opposed to this guy, his scapula are in place, but what most patients will do is slump a little bit forward and that will pull their scapula forward, giving you more area to work with right here. We've done the entire back. So now for the purpose of our exam, we're gonna ask the patient to swing the legs back around to the front and we're going to do the exact same thing in the front. We're gonna start with auscultation. Now, you've got three lobes on the right side of the lung, on the right lung, and the middle lobe can only be heard from the front. So we can't ever skip listening from the front. And the middle lobe is gonna be about this area here, usually around the level of the nipple. So we're gonna listen starting underneath the clavicle. Take a deep breath, please. And then listen. So you can also do percussion and you can also do fremitus in the front as well. Um, we're going to skip it for the purposes of this class, but understand that you can. Now, one of the reasons why we use this particular sequence of, of technique Number one, we're doing the most important thing first, which is auscultate. And that's what you're gonna do on most of your patients. When you first start as a nurse, you wanna do as much assessment as you can because you need to practice. But as you get better, you won't need to do all of the assessment on every patient. You can do just the auscultation, and then if there's a need to do those other techniques, you'll have them because you'll have practiced them. So that's the reason why we do it in this particular sequence. The other reason why we start at the bottom and then work our way toward the top is that that bottom area is the most important place to auscultate if the patient has something like pulmonary edema. And some of your elderly patients really can't give you more than one or two good breaths. So by starting at the bottom, at the base of the lung, we're doing the most important assessment first. So now let's document a normal respiratory exam. So think about what we did. So the first thing is when we documented, we looked at the patient, there was no dyspnea. If you want to say that positively, you could say eupnea, but hey, nobody says eupnea that I've never heard. So no dyspnea, no retractions. Um, the patient, or sorry, no tripoding. You could say the patient is upright, but no tripoding is more specific to what you're actually looking for here. And then um, the AP lat ratio was AP front to back is one to two. Um, if you put lat first, then it would be two to one. Some people get those backwards. So. Um, then we auscultated and we were clear to auscultation. CTA is, an, is a clear to auscultation. That's an abbreviation you'll see fairly commonly in some notes. Um, you might want to spell it out or you could even be more specific and say the actual breath sounds that you heard. So remember vesicular sounds are the normal breath sounds for most of the lung field, bronchovesicular toward the middle and then bronchial in the trachea and the exact center. Um, then we did excursion and the excursion was symmetrical and then we did fremitus and the fremitus was symmetrical and then percussion was resonant so remember resonant is the sound of normal lung tissue. If the lung tissue is consolidated, so it's become solid because there's a bunch of goo clogging up that part of the lung, then you would hear dull or flat. And if there is more air than usual in the lung, so if the patient had, say, COPD, then you would hear hyperresonance. As far as fremitus goes, uh, vibration travels more quickly through, sound, through um, solid than it does through air. So if you have pneumonia or consolidation, then you're going to feel have increased fremitus in that area of consolidation.
And that's it for, oh, sorry. And then we also have some peripheral things for respiratory. So you might need to document their skin and their nails in terms of clubbing and in terms of cyanosis. And that's it for respiratory.